You've talked about quadrupling Title I funding. You've also discussed changing the way in which that money is, is distributed and, uh, and applied. Talk to us about that. What would you change about it? What, what do you think is not working about the quarter of the money that, that you propose that is already going into the system? How would you make it more effective? It, 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 we need more money in Title I schools. I mean, it's just, it's expensive to, uh, to educate children who face so many challenges. You know, so many issues hit in our public schools. Homelessness hits right at the heart of our public schools. Um, food insecurity, a child who comes to school hungry, hits in our public schools. Um, children who are living in households that are having to move around, children that are living in households where they're not safe, these are all issues that bear down on our public schools. So the way we have to think about this is as a nation, it's time to make a real investment. And we can do this by asking those at the very top just to pay a little more. A two cent wealth tax, two cents from the top one tenth of one percent. Sorry, it goes up to three cents if you're a billionaire. The top one tenth of one percent. And what can we do? We can do universal childcare and universal early education for every baby in this country, age zero to five. We can do universal pre-K for every three-year-old and four-year-old in America. We can raise the wages of every childcare worker and preschool teacher in this country. We can make the investment of $800 billion in our public schools. We can make the investment in the colleges. We can raise the thresholds for Pell Grants so that people can actually get access to college. We can invest in our HBCUs. We can invest in canceling student loan debt. You can't do any of this without money. The question is not, how do we take what we're currently spending at the federal level and move it around? It's like borrowing from Peter to pay Paul. You just keep creating shortages because it's basically funded at way too small a level until we're willing to put the commitment down on paper and say, we want to invest not a little bit, but we want to invest what it takes to create a quality of opportunity for every one of our children. That's when we will make real change. Senator, I'm wondering, is there a priority? It's like a person who has a house, the roof is leaking, the windows are drafty, the door is falling apart. Is there a priority in terms of spending of all of the things that you just ticked off? It, yes, and that is asking the billionaires to put in two cents. No. You give me this face, look. And, and that two cents is for what exactly? It's to make the investment across the board. That's the point. Let's have- All at the same time? Money. Yes. Okay. Because there's enough money to do that. You know, maybe this is the shocking part, is that to ask the top one-tenth of 1% 1 in this country, the greatest 75,000 fortunes, that's what we're talking about here, to ask them to pay just two cents on their accumulated wealth. Anybody in here own a home? You've been paying a, pro you've been paying a wealth tax. It's just called a property tax. All I'm saying for these guys is your property tax ought to include uh, not only your real estate, but your stock portfolio, the diamonds, the Rembrandt, and the yacht. Right, right now, this year, the 99% will pay about 7.2% of their total wealth in taxes. That top one-tenth of 1% 1 will pay less than half that, 3.2%. Asking them to pitch in two pennies more or three pennies more so that every one of our children can have adequate funding to get a first-rate education from the time they're babies until they finish their post-high school education. I think that is more than fair, and I think that's how we build a real future in this country. Let's go to the you talk about valuing our teachers. Some are interested in how, as president, you would make certain that all of our children are valued as well. 
We're 65 years after Brown versus Board of Education, which was a design to say <clears throat> unanimously decision, a decision by the Supreme Court that said separate was not equal. And yet we have resegregated our schools in this country in a tremendous way. And they're separate and they are not equal. I want to read this because it's important. A 2019 study found that predominantly white school districts receive $2,226 more per student than the average non-white district. As president, can you change this? As president, can you bring about equity in funding in America's public schools? Yes, I believe we can and we must. Look, in But tell me how. I will. Everybody yeah. knows yeah. that it might be a great right. idea. Right. But how in the world will you do it? Well, this, this is what Title I is for, right? That's right. Look, most countries, if you've got an area where students are at a disadvantage, where they're uh, historically excluded, or where they're just low income, they would get more funding per pupil. One of the only countries where not only is that not the case, but so often, as you describe, it's less. And this is not just a question of economic fairness. It is a question of basic racial justice. And this is why we need to use the mechanisms of Title I, federal funding that I am proposing we triple, in order to make sure that more resources can go out and partner with states with carrots and sticks to press them to make sure that their funding formulas actually benefit those who most need the funding. Remember, we are one of the only countries also where these things are so different locally. And when you have property taxes as the main source of funding for education systems, as it is in so many parts of this country, poor kids are being punished for being poor. But we does that also punish that the government? Dollars. Does that also punish the country? If you punish poor kids for being poor, are you also punishing America for being a, a, a country that has poor people in it? Because poor people, if they don't have a job, what do they do? They're dependent on the government to say, yeah, help me. Right. Exactly. Here's something to think about. Uh, one of the folks on my policy team did a study on the value of having a great teacher and was able to compute. They got years of IRS numbers in order to show if you as a kindergartner had a great teacher, would that affect your earnings later on in life? They computed the value of a great teacher as three in terms of the lifetime earnings improvement of their students, $300,000 per kindergarten classroom per year. So that means those kids, when they have access to the right kind of educational resources, will in turn go on not only themselves to live well, but to create opportunity and to not need support from the government. Now, we have been told that tax cuts on the wealthy pay for themselves. This has been proven to be false. But there are forms of investment and spending that do pay for themselves. And investing to deal with the inequities you're talking about are exactly those kinds of investments that deserve to take place. And again, there is the racial inequality that threatens to drag down the entire country. Not only for those who are discriminated against because of the color of their skin, but the entire nation will not achieve its potential so long as these inequities persist. And part of that is about funding formulas. Part of it is about the relationship between neighborhood segregation and school segregation. Part of it that doesn't get talked about enough is a result of just how the boundaries of districts are drawn. And it's why I am proposing that we have a pre-clearance process, as we had to have with the Voting Rights Act, when there are major district boundary changes proposed. Otherwise, a school district may be able to say, look at us, we're integrated, we're good to go, only to turn around and realize that when you look at the bigger region or the community or the county or whatever it is, it remains segregated by race and separate has never, ever meant equal. So there's no question that your, your heart's in the right place about this. But as somebody who has teachers in their family, with a teacher in your household, who happens to be a mayor of a city, Look at the funding formula. More than $700 billion a year is spent in total on, on public funding. And the federal government makes up a small portion of that uh, with arguably limited influence. So the things you're talking about sound like the things you'd say as a husband of an educator, as a mayor of a city. But as president, 
how do you change that? People can vote for Pete Buttigieg because he's got the right ideas about education as president. But what do you know as a mayor, as the husband of a, of a teacher that says the right ideas as president translate to the right things for students and teachers? Right. Here's what I know is there's a lot more to what we've got to do to support children than just what we can expect of teachers. There's a lot, as we've just talked about, that we need to do around empowering teachers, supporting teachers. And there's a lot of work to do to make sure that we continue developing our curricula for the future, that we have more of an investment in things like problem solving and social and emotional learning that's only going to become more important as the economy changes, but again, also matters because we're not just preparing workers, we're preparing citizens. There's all of that. But when you're a mayor, you also see all of the things that attach to this. How can you expect a child to learn well or a teacher to be able to support that child if they are hungry when they show up? If they've been through multiple adverse childhood experiences, violence, trauma, the incarceration of a parent, homelessness, Things that kids are up against that are not only something we can put on a teacher or a school or a school system to handle, but that we've got to deal with in terms of wraparound services. That's what you see as a mayor. It's why we funded, for example, programs in the evening after kids were, were moving out of the school environment, but they're still hungry and they still need mentorship and they need somebody offering love and support and encouragement. And we could do that in community centers funded by the city. But Community centers are right there waiting for us in the school buildings ourselves, themselves, if we invest in the model of community schools. We have that in the, in the west side of South Bend at one school. It creates a tremendous opportunity to deal with something even deeper in this country that I think is a crisis, which is a crisis of belonging. We have a crisis of belonging that has more and more Americans told for different reasons and in different ways, because uh, your race or where you are economically or who you love or what language you speak at home that you don't fit. We are in desperate need of things that are shared in this country. For me, I think a lot about military service because in my own life, it was something I shared with people who were completely different from me. Public schools and community schools can be that kind of touchstone as well something that we share. And if our public schools are excellent, if every neighborhood public school is a school of choice, then it will be a place where something that is so frighteningly rare in this country happens, which is not only students learning side by side, but parents and families and community members coming together to view that, that place as something that belongs to all of them, reminding us of how the country can be something that belongs to all of us as well. Thank you for that. We have a question from